Okay, let's work on this football soccer or baseball. Can you imagine doing either of those blind or like blind poses? Well, you're going to be amazed because there is a baseball team that plays blindfolded. The players are visually impaired or blind. And they play baseball. And not only do they play, they win. Now, several teams right here in the United States, and they get together for a World Series. Oh my gosh, what's this stuff happening? I learned something the other day because we're always perpetually learning, right? But we also, because this is about a movie. So I have my other logo up here. We said, honey, go to the movies today. She said, We've got the most amazing movie about flying feet baseball. Anyway, stay tuned because we're going to have some fun and learn all about this fascinating documentary about flying baseball. Stay tuned. Hi, I'm Honey Gregory, and welcome to my channel. As usual, I have two amazing guests today. You guys are just going to be so excited. Oh my gosh, I can't even tell you. I'm like almost like nervous. I'm like a, like a, a fangirl right now happening because I've already seen the movie. So we're going to talk about this amazing movie today because my dear friend, who I've known, I don't even know, like five, ten years, something like that, him and his good friend have produced the most amazing movie. Uh, so I want to welcome my special guest today. Uh, the co-producers of a great movie called Thunder Rolls, and we'll get into that. Um, so my dear friend, Bob Arnoff, he is, oh my God, what is he not? I can't even tell you. So um, he's like an international scholar. He's an author. He's an IU professor. He's, he's produced documentaries, and the story and list just goes on, as well as his amazing, amazing uh, co-producer and good friend, colleague, uh, Susan Schwibb who is a, an award-winning award -winning filmmaker, you know, we got one right here, right here with us today. So she is a um, IU um, professor at the School of Media, and she's worked on other projects with Bob. So thank you so much, Bob and Susan, for being here today. I just feel so honored, so honored to have you guys. Thank you and welcome. Thank you. That's yeah. a wonderful introduction. <laughs> So I started looking at the bio and I was like, oh, well, I know these people, but my gosh, I didn't know these people. <laughs> Without revealing ages, I would say, Michelle, I go back at least about 15 years. Is so. that long? Oh my God, don't tell me. Maybe you're closer to like the but yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, no, I'm just teasing you. No, uh, Bob, I just adore you. You're just such an amazing man. And um, I've never been anything but impressed by you and all the great works and things that you do for the community. And I'm learning the same kind of things about you, Susan. You're fantastic as well. And you guys have collaborated before, and now you've collaborated on this most amazing film that uh, you recently premiered called Thunder Roll. So you want you guys want to tell us about that? We can decide who goes first. I'd say Bob goes first because um, he had the first connection with Blind Baseball. <laughs> okay, fantastic. Go ahead, Bob. Well, my connection with Blind Baseball goes to my cousin, uh, and and uh, he pitched. He was a pitcher for the Boston Renega uh, Renegades. It was one of some 22, 23 domestic teams. Mm -hmm. And in blind baseball, the, the beep ball, uh, the ball beeps and the batters can hear it and they're all blindfolded. They have different degrees of blindness um, and visual impairment. And the pitcher and the catcher are sighted and they're on the same team as the batters. So wow. they are pitching to the batters to make sure they hit, unlike uh, uh, in uh, regular baseball. And then... Um, the uh, the rest of the players are in a continuum of blindness from being blind uh, at birth to actually in the process of filming over six years. 
as there's one family, three yeah. members of the family are going progressively blind. Yeah. So uh, I had made a movie with Suzanne back in the 1980s on the 1984 uh, Nicaraguan elections. And she was the editor, I was the producer. And when I talked to my cousin, this is going back to about 2001, 2002, when I was retiring from IU, he told me about what he was doing. And I like making documentary films. I'm not a a, a dedicated uh, filmmaker like Suzanne, who's that's her specialty, teaching about it and, and creating documentaries. So I said, I want to make one. And the first person I thought of making it with was Suzanne. Mm -hmm. So then I went to her in 2016 and I proposed the idea to her and she liked it. And then we had to find a team. So I'll turn it over now to Suzanne. Yeah, um, I like the idea. Of, I, I, Before I taught at the media school, and actually just to be correct, I don't know if you're gonna keep that in, but I'm a senior lecturer, I'm not a professor. Oh, okay, my bad. <laughs> no, no, it's, uh, it's confusing. All the students call me professor. So the activity <laughs> and relationship is professorial, but <laughs> okay. awesome. no, that's amazing. Still amazing. Still great and amazing. I love it. Yeah, yeah. Well, before I started teaching full time, I was actually a producer at the local public television station, um, WTIU. So I I I'd done a complicated project like this where you followed like a whole long process. It was called Hub Dreams. It was about the international hub competition here. Mm -hmm. And we sort of followed individual people. And when when Bob Hurst talked to me about it, that was the project I was thinking of because I thought it's similar because we decided to follow, you know, if you can, we follow a team as they're pursuing a championship. And we found out that there's actually a, there were several strong teams in Indianapolis. And um, we thought, well, maybe that's the approach to take, um, following the players, telling their stories, but also it's all sort of embedded in this quest to win a championship. Mm -hmm. And it so happened that the very first team that we called was the Indy Thunder mm -hmm. and their coach <laughs> and manager and the person who does so much for them is uh, Darnell Booker. And he was very enthusiastic. He like immediately told us, oh, you never know who's watching, which is like the opening line. Bob can tell you more about that. <laughs> yeah, I saw an interview of him and he is yeah. just like super, super, duper dedicated to this. Like this is his absolute passion. It's his, it really is like Ron Brown, who's one of the other characters in the film says it's his baby. Yeah. He is so committed to that sport and he is so committed to creating um, a community around that sport. He cares about every single one of his team members way beyond what's happening on the field. So um, he was super enthusiastic and said, oh yes, absolutely. And um, I'm gonna take it to, because they're actually organized as a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. So he said, I'm gonna take it to the board and propose it to them and, and then we'll go from there. And we went up there and met them all and um, I watched them play a little bit. And then we went to the board and presented that, actually we videotaped that. Um, mm -hmm. We presented to them what we were after and what we wanted to do and what we wouldn't do. So, um, um, so, and, you know, it was, I guess, like a marriage made in heaven because they were enthusiastic about it. And of course we are. Yeah. So uh, the rest is that. history. Yeah, so the year was 2016 when we first approached them. And uh, that summer, this was in the spring of 2016, uh, in the summer in Ames, Iowa, was the uh, World Series. And I went to that, but without a film crew, I just wanted to see what was involved. And of course, things were coming out that you normally wouldn't think about, which you saw in the movie, which is doggy daycare. Yeah. The, professors, the dogs have to be taken care of, or the role of the empires and, and, and everything else surrounding, bringing people uh, from around the country. And actually in 2017, from the Dominican Republic, Taiwan, and uh, Canada, to uh, Iowa. And uh, so uh, then in 2017, we added uh, some crew, uh, Suzanne Pick, uh, an assistant editor, and then David Gadaitis, the director of photography. And uh, David was actually supposed to go down to us in Nicaragua, with us in Nicaragua in the 1980s on that film we worked on, but he got canceled at the last moment. Mm -hmm. And then we added an animator and a narrator and a composer. So that sort of constituted um, the team. And then, so the one thing I want to say about 2017, when we went to uh, West Palm Beach to, to film the World Series, 
2016, they won their first World Series. And um, the goal of the film was, the as uh, Suzanne mentioned, was to follow them in the quest to create and uh, uh, accomplish a second world championship. And the one of the virtues of the film is all the tension is naturally built into it. Uh, we didn't uh, try to script anything. And what happened, that natural tension was built in because for the double elimination game uh, series, uh, they lost one game to their arch rival, the San Antonio Jets. And then they had to go on and win seven straight games, including at the very end, two against the previously undefeated national team from Taiwan. And it came down to the sixth game to one run at the and the final out. And uh, as Suzanne knows, I'll say, no, I don't want this to happen. <laughs> and as our director of photography, David, said, well, it's not good for the team, but it's good for the film. Yeah, well, I mean, and, you know, the film just builds and builds and builds, and it's so amazing. I don't want to get all those because everybody needs to see this because it's just so fascinating. But I just know that all of a sudden, the entire audience just started cheering and jumping and clapping. And it was like, you wanted them to win so badly <laughs> by the end. You're like, oh my God. Yes. You know, we've been, great audience. Yeah. we've been so happy about that because um, that doesn't happen that often in films that you actually get so much into it that you, because mm -hmm. <laughs> you know it's a film and it already has a finished conclusion. Right. But um, that happened before when we were showing it at the Heartland Film Festival, the audience erupted in applause as well. And that really does make you feel good. Um, yeah, you guys did such a great job at it. And and then you add the component of the compassion of the coach and the players. And you you see these people that are, um, for lack of better words, you know, handicapped or challenged or whatever, being able to see their dreams come true, even though they have this, I hate saying this kind of word, limitation, you know, because they really don't have a limitation. You know, when you see this, you realize that, oh my gosh, these people are just amazing people, you know, getting the opportunity to do something. And who ever yeah. thought about playing baseball blind, you know, so amazing. Yeah, I I, I thought about this um, a little, and it's, you know, one of the things that we love about sports or anything where people do something extraordinary is that they go a little beyond what sort of life presents them you know and oh, of course yeah. that's what we celebrate that somebody can jump higher and farther and run faster and um and um with the uh with the players here you actually end up forgetting that because they are mm -hmm. they are incredibly fast they are incredibly accurate mm -hmm. they are very competitive um they don't think about you know um the limitations they have because that's part of it's built into every sport i mean every sport tends to be modified to make it a little bit more difficult. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is one difficulty, I suppose. Um, but uh, um, then, you know, within those constraints, you try to excel. Mm -hmm. And and that's what, I, as Bob often talked about, if you make, if you modify the rules and, and provide the technology, then it allows you to, to create the limitations against which you can go. That is run fast to the base, pick up the ball faster than the better and, and all of those things. Right. I know. One of the, uh, this all came out because toward the beginning of the film, we have them playing a scrimmage game at Victory Field in Indianapolis against the professional baseball team, the Indianapolis Indians, including the uh, the um, captain of the team, Josh Bell, who now is in the major leagues and has been in the major leagues for at least the last three, four years, was talking about, you know, they they were able to hit the ball, but the more difficult thing was being able to run to the base, and of course, some of the amusing scenes in the movie was these these big guys running very daintily towards the the buzzing first of their base, and then <laughs> one of their colleagues taking the base and moving it so they didn't know where the base was. Oh yeah, I saw that. That was hilarious. That was hilarious. Uh, I loved yeah, it. The, the other thing is we want to go back to Darnell because we uh, and and as uh, Suzanne mentioned, Ron Brown and and the rest, uh, Gene Brown and the various people we featured and profiled is that Darnell Booker is just a very charis charismatic uh, coach leader, just an inspiration. Mm -hmm. And as he said, he's married to Beatball. 
and quite honestly, in his personal life, because he's been married to beat ball, that he hasn't been able to have a steady partner. <laughs> and we figure, okay, now that the film is out there, darn now you're going to have all these women chasing. <laughs> well, he's going to be famous so now. We'll see if that happens. <laughs> he's a nice looking guy, so a lot of women are probably lining up for him. Good looking guy, too. <laughs> yeah, good looking, athletic, won championship. What do women want to be interested in that, right? Yeah. So yeah. tell me about this narrator. Now, everybody's heard this name, but I don't know what you said. Well, the narrator is a well-known uh, A team uh, A listed um, movie star Jesse Eisenberg, but I seem to have some access to him when it comes to stay in Bloomington over the summer, and uh, Suzanne and I invited him to go uh, to visit uh, that scrimmage game I was talking about with Indianapolis Indians, and then afterwards. Um, we were interviewed, uh, it was mostly Jesse and, and um, Darnell by one of the local TV stations in Indianapolis. Mm -hmm. And you know, Jesse on his own said, I love, I love the Indy Thunder and I'm going to do whatever I can to help them. And so then when we showed him the uh, the movie, he, lo he, he loved it and he was willing to narrate it. So oh, that's as so much. But I would say that in a very competitive field, the very fact that you asked me that, that question means, and other people too, that you call attention to the film mm -hmm. and this is what you want to do. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> the film yeah. itself is amazing and the number the narrator would be is yeah, great. Yeah. But uh, when you have the components of great producers, great storyline, great narrator, but then you also have a great composer who is an award winner as well. So tell us about this. I mean, this movie has everything. So tell us yes. about this composer. Yeah, Tyron Cooper is uh, the person who, who wrote the score. And of course I know him because he also um, is a professor and a working um, composer at Indiana University. And I interviewed him once before, um, but I also know that he writes scores. And um, because this is, kind of an Indianapolis story and Indianapolis is his hometown. He was actually the first person we thought of. Um, we thought um, that he would match really well to the film and and he immediately said yes. <laughs> so. Wow, that's fantastic. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and the, yeah, the animator, Thomas DeCarlo is also locally based and he is okay. making a major animated movie about an alien from another planetary system coming to the US, uh, to the States uh to a high security site and the only language he can communicate in is spanish with the locals <laughs> and um he's also a very talented animator and the, the thing he's working on now has the potential to be a major award-winning full-length animated movie so mm -hmm. we're very blessed to have these people and, yeah. and enthusiastic and work well with us and they were local local so that was great yeah mm -hmm. what a what a collaboration. It's amazing. So tell me about the feedback. What is everyone saying? What, what do people say to you? Give me some stories. Well, well these are my friends. So <laughs> and Suzanne's always skeptical. So, oh, they're, they're your friends. But I'll use some of the terms they use because these are not terms I invented. <laughs> um, but tour de force, a major, brilliantly edited fantastic, wonderful feeling, so humanistic, so nice to have you a good right. story. And it goes on and on. And we're not asking for this. One said it was the perfect film. Someone who's into baseball said it was his most valuable filmmaker, uh, 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 you know, award, you know, a filmmaker's award. So, yeah, this is, uh, and as I say, they come up and it may be just because we're local and the expectations were low for me and not necessarily for Susan. Oh, my we just I, the mind. No. The mind. I am always <laughs> hypercritical because I mean I know lots of documentaries um that are out there and um there's a tendency I mean one of the things I, I really like about the film and I think that people also respond to is that um this sport um it's a volunteer sport and it has people of all ages from all walks of life um, you know, we have one player who's from Pakistan, another player who's from Mexico and, and, um, uh, you know, 15 year old and 50 year olds and, um, um, and the sport is what makes them all work together without really, 
addressing that head on is just a wonderful metaphor for really in a way that you wish so, so society always would operate. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, oh, um, yeah. and I think that's one thing I believe that people respond to. Um, that's at least what I, 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 I heard that from friends that watched it and, and they said, you know, this is so amazing. This, not just the sport brings it together, but that the film shows all these different people collaborating and working together without much fuss and muss. <laughs> yeah, I'm nice. and that's one of, one of the reasons why the film is 97 minutes long. And, you know, if there's any criticism, they, they might be this is a little too long. But then we've been reluctant to cut anything because what the people are saying, what they like so much about the film is the completeness of it. Mm -hmm. It shows these people's lives. And I've even had these discussions with uh, Suzanne about, do you want to show the person uh, going home with his dog, uh, his guide dog, and showing all the way home, and then how he has to navigate walking without a sidewalk, with cars passing by, and then finally getting to the safety of his apartment? Mm -hmm. But it all works. It all works. And mm -hmm. that's to Suzanne's credit with her editing, which was brilliant. So yeah, Right. Um, and, you know, um, we both have a background in education. And um, uh, there, 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 there are things in the film that you learn, not just, you know, how this particular sport is run, but you learn things about, you know, what a guide dog does and what they don't do, things like that. And and I had a colleague once, he, he, he said that uh, a lot of the films that he sees that I made, there's always you know, you sort of get along in the story and then there's something you learn, you know, it's mm -hmm. like you start asking a question, you said, how is that? And then it gets answered. And, um, and I think, you know, in a little, little way, this is the same here too. You actually learn a lot. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's not that, it, yeah, it's not just, oh yeah, blind people can also play baseball. It's much more. It's yeah. the fullness of their lives. That's Even true. though, you know, you can't show everything, obviously, then the film would be really long. <laughs> You'd <laughs> yeah. have to do a series. <laughs> yeah, well, well there you, you know, go. The, There's an idea right there, because they, yeah. they're probably going back to the championship at the end, you know. You know, the um, talking about uh, the, the blind dogs and everything, one of them, a, a really interesting scene, including for the people, for example, the University of Michigan, the Kellogg Eye Center, is the, the one of the uh, episodes is about uh, the pitcher, Jared, at Western Michigan University in Kalamazoo going and learning how to navigate the, the streets of Kalamazoo yep. blind with the instructor who's teaching them how to problem solve because this is what he's going to be having to teach his clients. He's not mm -hmm. only a pitcher, but this is his profession of working uh, with people who are blind and visually impaired. <laughs> He's navigating right down the middle of the street yeah, with exactly. guys coming on both sides, of, and then and then and then uh, the instructor and he said, "Well, what do I do now?" The and he, well, the instructor says, "The cars on your right, and there's cars on the left, and you're going down the middle of the street. What do you do?" Right. That <laughs> was one of those. <laughs> Another one of those moments where you go, this is going to be very good for the film because mm -hmm. I was walking behind him with like just a little GoPro camera so that I could be like close up and move around. And mm -hmm. um, and as he turned, because we were crossing the street and then he turned right into the traffic and we we're all going like, oh, yeah. let's just go with it. I know. <laughs> I was watching, I was like, oh, my can't God. See it because it was behind the cameras. I just waved at the cars and <laughs> said, thank you. Just let it go. <laughs> but they were, they were courteous enough to stop. Yeah, yeah, yeah they were really <laughs> great. But they figured, what, is going, what is going on here? But if it was showing that he's going to have to teach the people he works out a problem solve, and that's what they were doing with him. And it was. Right, right. And, and what's kept, nice about that is. Uh, kept on inventing ops. Oh, you, sir, you can't go here. There's water, you know, uh, whatever, height, and that's erupted. Yeah, that was funny. Right. That had me and, uh, there, there, There is a person that, by the name of David Benny. He runs an um, online publication called Beatball Nation. And he wrote very enthusiastically about the film. And he actually mentioned that this was something that he had never seen. He had never, uh, he, he, does, he has never seen um, what goes into the training of a person who gets a degree in, in orientation mobility. And so, he, you know, it's, so there's a lot of learning all around. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was, I was taken back. I couldn't believe it because 
I, you know, I was watching, you know, you were talking about the dogs earlier, and I thought, oh, I never thought of that. Of course, they would have to have doggy daycare and all that stuff. I mean, well, who's going to take care of the dog when they're playing? And I was like, it was totally a learning moment. I was like, I never imagined that. I never considered it. And it was like, in fact, when I got home, I told my daughter who loves animals, I was like, oh my gosh, honey, I wish you had gone because the best part was the little doggies. They had, they were there and they were helping people get their dreams and being a part of it. I was like, you would have loved this, you know. She's like, oh, I think I missed it, you know. And it was like, you just don't think about that stuff. And then when he's walking down the street and going right in the middle of the traffic and he's you're going all these crazy directions. I was like, oh my gosh, I never thought about how you have no sense of north, south, east, and west because you can't you can't see like you like you lose that connection somehow mm -hmm. with your surroundings. So all that right. community definitely you know, so this is what I called about casting the net wide in the filmmaking or what I talked about serendipity is when you're doing a research project, you really <laughs> want to have these totally unexpected things happening and grab them as you can, because this is not something you're plotting out or scripting. It's there and it's unique and very special. And that's what we were trying to do with the movies, bring out these very unique, special moments that normally you wouldn't think about. Yeah. Well, I remember it's when not, you were, I'm sorry, go ahead. And it's not like we knew all this ahead of time. You know, mm -hmm. we were learning, we were learning about, the world of blind baseball as we were right. going along and 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 um and it's just this i mention that to my students sometimes you know yeah. you just have to observe and listen and then you respond and oftentimes making a documentary is sort of iterative you know just like the research that bob is talking about you you have an idea you're interested in and you look at it and then you discover things and mm -hmm. this is one reason they take a long time to make <laughs> No, they do. You go right? down so... various paths, and then you try to make it. You we're it's almost like we're we're discovering it with the audience, except we did it a little bit before. So hopefully, then the film works so that for the audience, it's a discovery as well. So what was the total amount of time that it took you guys to try to make? Well, what well, well, initially the total footage we had was one hundred and ten hours or more, mm -hmm. and we had whittled down to an hour and a half essentially. Mm -hmm. When you guys, you collaborated, you came together with, you said 2016? We, we, so 2016, Suzanne and I, but when we actually film, did the filming mm -hmm. was 2017. Oh, okay. And okay. then from 2007. And during that period, they went on and won five straight world championships. Oh, and they finally lost one to a rival team in Indianapolis. But with the same players who had been on the 2000, many of the players on the 2017 team, like in professional baseball, <laughs> then moved on to a rival they team. They got traded, huh? These they got traded. Had, <laughs> these are people who had been trained by Darnell. Yeah. And they went on to beat his. <laughs> no his, wonder he won. He needs to have them <laughs> sign some sort of non compete agreement or something. <laughs> uh, no. No, and that's one of the wonderful things about Daniel. He really cares about the sport mm -hmm. as a whole, mm -hmm. and and so he he said he even said that early on to us. You know, some people go someplace else, and I, if that's what they would like to do, I, I don't hold it against them. And sometimes he'll even encourage it because mm -hmm. they'll come back richer. Then when they come back, he doesn't say, "Oh no, you went with the competing yeah, team." Yeah. Um, he's very much into and actually the whole uh, uh, the players also comment on the fact that they they feel like the whole beat baseball community is one community and one family. Yes, mm -hmm. the closest family is their team, but then, and of course they compete against other teams, but they all have relationships um, and friendships across teams and and stay in contact. And of course, when they have the, the World Series and they compete, then that's a way for them to all be together, even though there's also the competitive aspect. And then you see them after each game lining up, and this is all age groups. You have some that are about seven, eight, who are part of the team, part of the family, and they're all going, good game, good game, good game, hugging each other. Oh, yeah, and cool. you hear them say, they say, good game, brother, you know, and they hug and, you know. It's... They hug each other. There was one scene where the uh, the woman on the uh, Kirsten, on, on one of the Eastern uh, East Coast teams, is hugging a player from the Dominican Republic and actually crying and saying what well, it's a privilege to play with someone from the Dominican Republic. Really emotional. Mm 
Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. Wasn't he like from there as himself or something, or isn't it his heritage or something? And that's why he was hugging him. Like no, it was, was just it was just, just yeah, the, the emotion of emotion. having him from the Dominican Republic coming to play with him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Just you know, a bunch of guys really wanting to. And I think was there a woman on? That was a woman. There are okay. there are women on all of the teams. Okay. When it gets really competitive, then there usually are fewer women because mm -hmm. the men can run a little faster and hit a little harder. Yeah, but, that's always and, a thing. Isn't it? Uh, for whatever reasons, <laughs> there's not an all women's team though, right? Darnell. Yeah, there is now. Yeah, yeah. Okay. and uh, then they also had a, a competition with from the east or west or the north and the south. Uh, mm -hmm. Right before the uh, the final World Series games in 2017, there were two female teams competing. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I yeah. think there is a team now called the St. Louis Spirit. Is it Spirit? Probably. <laughs> Probably. Yeah. And it's all, all women. But even when we were filming, they had um they have a group called Women of Our League, and it's a sort of you know they meet and they discuss um uh, not just the baseball related question, but they also formed a team. Um, they formed an event where everything was done by women, the umpiring, um, the volunteering, the the spotters, and all of the players were, were women and they played. So you... every, everyone benefits from the, the strengths and the diversity. And that's you, you remember at the very end, the conclusion was the person being inducted into the Hall of Fame of, of beat baseball. And uh, he had let, his life turned around. Mm -hmm. I beat baseball. And then he said, you know, in society, we try to get people to cooperate and bring their strengths, et cetera. But here in beat baseball, this is you can't go forward and win unless all of you are working together and bring mm -hmm. your strengths and everything. And that's what the movie's showing. And uh, that's what we're concluding with. Everyone has something to bring to the table. And working as a team and as a family, you're going to accomplish your goals. Yeah. yeah, it's beautiful. Great story, great morals. I mean, it's the whole package. So where can someone see it if they want to see it? <laughs> uh, they got to see it. They got to see it. We can't just tell them that. They got to see it. Well, uh, we entered it in some festivals. So mm -hmm. until that sort of cycle is over, we're... We would like to eventually, uh, hopefully, get it like on public television, but we might also show it locally in Bloomington one more time. <laughs> yeah, for PBS yeah. or something. Like yeah, that. but we're PBS trying to get a, a streaming service like Netflix or Amazon yeah. or Disney or whatever to get it. That's why we're entering the competitions right now. Okay. And it's, it's, and it's just, you know, it's very competitive, so we'll see. But we were very <laughs> fortunate to have our world premiere at the Harlan International Film Festival, and we were an official selection. Yeah. Wow. It's so amazing. You guys are just so awesome. I love it. Okay. <laughs> so if someone else had a dream to make a documentary, what is your best tip and advice you could go have seen? Well, Suzanne, what do you say? Oh, it's always <laughs> financing is the problem. Yes. <laughs> getting, the, getting the funds because oh, wait, uh, that's the major. But often being at the university, we could use the university's resources free. I mean, you know, all the pro bono free services labor that was provided for this film. That's why it mm -hmm. took so long. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah um, the You can make a documentary uh, with, with a core crew because... Um, you know, we basically had a core crew of four, <laughs> Bob and me and Henry and David. That mm. was the basic core crew. Um, but there are some things that you need other specialized professionals like the the color grading and the sound mix. Um, mm. And then, you know, we're talking about money. Well, ideally, you even pay the core crew. But, you know, we all sort of gave our time to this because we were mm. really invested in telling that story. Mm. Um but yeah, uh, there there is some collaborative work, and oftentimes you do need to assemble a team and pay for them. So <laughs> that's <laughs> that's the big hindrance. But but if you really care about a story and really want to tell it nowadays, it is so much easier. Equipment is more accessible. I remember when I was a student, equipment was not that accessible um, at all. Um, the production equipment was expensive. And it was in various places and organizations, and it was really difficult to get to it. But nowadays, um, a video camera can be had for relatively little money. You can get 
microphones for relatively little money and you might have friends that have something actually like our group I have a camera and David Goditis has some other things and we constantly trade stuff he's just like ah can I borrow your camera mm -hmm. so I mean it is much more possible now yeah. yeah well I would say the motivation was never to make money I mean we had to put out money uh, but a goal is not to make money I mean if it happens that's fine but with uh, documentary making, it's storytelling, and there was an important story that needed to be told. And as uh, Susanna mentioned, when you, you tell people you're going to make a movie about the world of blind baseball, so how can how is that possible? Well, now we're going to show you how that's yeah. possible. Yeah, I remember when you said to me, I don't know where I lost this one from one day, and you were telling me, you're going to make a movie about blind baseball players. I was like, what are you talking about? Don't do this. I had no idea. So this is going to be, a, you know, a, an eye-opener and educational experience for a lot of people. I mean, it's such a good story. That's you guys we... are so amazing. Well, thank you for the interview. Well, thank, you. thank you. Yeah, thank you, Bob, so much for joining me today on my podcast. And and I hope you guys collaborate and do some more wonderful things. We're you got some more about... ideas? That's what we want to do. Uh, yeah, one was the more in-depth analysis of the principles in the movie. We got all that footage, oh, and so then picking up, and that yeah, and then and then picking out uh, some other sport that may be played by people who are visually impaired, and then of course Suzanne likes the idea of there's a team in, a a chess team in uh, the Cook County Jail. It seems like it's an interesting thing to wow. focus on people who are at a disadvantage and what they can accomplish. But I, I loved working with Suzanne and the whole team we had was very, very close to our family, just the way uh, you see the uh, Indy Thunder being a family, we become very close. So, yeah. Uh -huh. That's yeah. wonderful. That's yeah. heartwarming and beautiful. Thank you. Yes, thank you. And thank you for, for having us. Well, I wish you guys much, much luck and success in the future and I can't wait to hear about new projects and see what you guys have. Let me know who's coming back to Bloomington because I'm going to make them back later. <laughs> well, thank right. you, Susan. Yep. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. I enjoyed it so much. And I, uh, I, you guys are a blessing to the community. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye. Bye-bye. Right. Thank you. Bye-bye.